We will start uh, today's cabinet uh, meeting. Um, first of all, item one is apologies for absence. I think we are all here. Thank you very much. Uh, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? Yeah, because the, um, the, the game interest in the autism have uh, um, event because I'm a. Um, uh, uh, on the CVS board. So. Will you be leaving for that discussion? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll declare an interest in regards to item um, six, an indirect interest. Um, my wife's a primary school teacher in Telford. I was also going to declare an interest because my daughter is a primary teacher in Telford as well. Okay, but it's not peculiar. Uh, no. Okay, excellent. Um, item three then is the minutes of our previous meeting, pages three to ten. Can I see a, a mover for those? Yeah. Those are moved, and I'll sorry, those in due course. Item four, um, just two very brief uh, announcements, uh, both of uh, congratulations. Councillor Hilda Rowe, who won um, the LGIU uh, Lifetime Achievement Award um, over the last couple of weeks. A fantastic achievement, and Hilda has been a councillor longer than I've been born. Um, so uh, a, a lifetime of uh, 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 service to Telford and Reekin, and I hope that we all can uh, join in celebrating Hilda's success, and we'll mark that at the full council. And also, um, an absolute delight that uh, my fellow ward member, my predecessor, uh, called it Sahota's elevation to the House of Lords. Lord, Lord called it Sahota, who makes his induction into the House of Lords on Monday. A real achievement uh, for called it personally, um, but also a huge recognition, I think, for Telford and our Sikh community um, here and across the country. I hope, again, we can all be happy and send our celebrations and congratulations to called it on that uh, achievement. Item five, then, is um, the Leader and Cabinet Member Young Persons Grant Scheme. Uh, Councillor Reynolds. Thank you, Leader. Uh, happy for you today. The Leader and Cabinet Grant Scheme report. This scheme has been released since 2017 and it's getting more successful every year. As can be seen in the report, this year we've reached an even wider, more diverse audience. You will see that we've been able to award funds to more young people, including our care experience youngsters, with a 12% increase in the numbers awarded. The wider reach has been achieved by widened participation, including how the applications can be made, with the use of videos, artwork and media content alongside the written submissions. I welcome the continued support of Ariva, who provided travel passes, and I hope that other companies will also get on board, excuse the pun, and help our young people, recognising the social impact that their support has. The communications this year have been much more targeted, using much more appropriate social media platforms like Instagram and TikTok. This has proved really <coughs> beneficial, ensuring we reach our target audience. This has also been complemented by visits to schools, colleges, carers and other partners. The statistics speak for themselves, with nearly 845,000 clicks to our web pages via social media. I welcome the inclusion next year of the alumni event, thus inviting back former winners, giving them the opportunity I don't either, giving them the opportunity to share their success stories across so many areas. These young people will be able to inspire the next generation of award winners from sculptors, teaching assistants, graphic artists and university experiences. Sharing their life stories and experiences, showing what a difference the Leader and Cabinet Award Scheme makes to them, whether that be removing barriers to education, access to employment or providing tools for their success in their future careers. I'd like to thank the officers for their work behind the scenes. They've spent so much time helping our young people throughout the application process. And also to our leader, Councillor Sean Davis, for introducing this scheme. Its legacy is amazing. I move the report and the recommendations 1.1 to 1.3. Thank you, that's seconded. Thank you very much. Uh, any comments or contributions from members of the Cabinet? Andrew? Uh, just a couple of quick points, really. Um, I think it is important to measure outcomes and success with this sort, of, uh, this sort of scheme. I was just curious, and who decides, who allocates the sort of beneficiaries of uh, this, the scheme itself? I, I welcome it. Um, anything that gives kids a good chance or gives them a bit of encouragement, and uh, it's, it's, they all need it these days. There's so many pressures on them, so I welcome the report. Thank you. Can I just say that um, for me, uh, when you go and speak to the young people who have received the award, 
um, of course, the money is important, um, and we're not talking about a huge amount of money in, in the term in, in the scheme of things. We're talking about five hundred pounds, but the difference that that makes to those young people's lives is such, is so significant. But also more than that, it's about the recognition um, that um, those young people receive from their council, uh, a, a belief and a confidence that they can they, they can succeed, um, and um, a belief and a um, a confidence that we want to invest in those young people and, and their future. Um, and I remember growing up in Telford um, and um, struggling to get a laptop to go to university. And my employer um, was able to uh, help me out. But if it wasn't for my employer, then I wouldn't have been able to have a laptop to go to university. And that would have made a, a huge difference to what I couldn't and couldn't achieve at university. So I know that this makes a massive, massive difference. I'm really looking forward to the alumni event. I think it leaks into one of the questions that Andrew has, uh, which is about hearing back uh, the stories um, of our young people. And many of them stay in contact with the team. Those are recorded um, and, uh, succeed, uh, and a huge uh, amount of success can be derived from that. Um, and I um, have been on the awards panel uh, together with Shirley and others um, over the last few years. And each year, the, uh, the calibre of application goes up and up and up. Um, and what's also amazing is that since we've changed it from a simple paper-based application and allowed people, young people to express themselves in, in any way that they feel would be supportive of their application, again, the calibre and quality of the uh, applications has gone up. So I think this is something we all should uh, get behind. And if we can't believe, and if we can't invest in our young people in Telford and Rican, then who can? Uh, Shirley. Yeah, I mean, you say about, you know, who decides who awards it. Obviously, the young people make the applications. We do have a written application form, but as has already been said, they can send in video evidence, they can send in artwork. They have to send in, with their application, at least two written references. We have officers here that speak to the young people, check there's everything in there they want, evidence of what it is they want and what a difference it will make. We follow up with the references to ensure that the references speak highly of the young person why they need it so it is a very thorough process and then officers obviously go through and they'll look at what's required there's a strict criteria they have to meet that they're applying for some of the grants it may be you know yes it is up to 500 but they might be applying they want 200 pounds to buy some knives to become a chef they make big differences to people's lives so there is quite a strict criteria and then eventually we have a very very difficult time as Shauna said, you know, myself and others, we have a panel where we go through each and every application, making sure they've got everything they need and the decisions are made about what difference it makes. Could that money be sought from other sources? Because sometimes young people may apply for something, but we're able to direct them to somewhere else where that money could come from. So it's a very, very strict process, but it is really good. Thank you. So that's been moved, it's been seconded. All those in favour? That's everybody. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Laura. Um, if we now move to item six then, which is the school growth report, uh, Shirley. Thank you, Leader. Again, this report also shows how we support families across the borough with clear evidence of school expansions over the last decade of this administration. We also made good use of the purposeful design of our BSF schools, which were designed to be expanded when required. The report outlines our school growth plans for both our primary and secondary estate. And I'm pleased to provide details of two new primary schools coming forward in areas of residential development, together with further expansion of existing schools. The report also highlights our continued commitment to increase our SEN hubs in community settings. The current growth in primary numbers will peak in 23-24 and then they will reduce without ongoing pressures on admissions. We understand families wanting to move into our borough to live, work and raise their families. We have so many excellent facilities, our roadworks, employment sites, cultural facilities, world heritage site, our excellent school estate, numerous award winning green flag parks to name just a few, who wouldn't want to live in our amazing borough. We continue to plan for this growth, increasing capacity of our schools, investing significantly in our school estate across the borough and working with our partners to ensure that exciting prospects and new post-educational 16 opportunities will be available within the new station quarter. During the BSF programme, all secondaries were either refurbished or rebuilt, together with many primaries, an investment of over 200 million. 
Disappointingly, the Tory government cut this funding as soon as they came into office, but Telford and Rekin retained 43 million. When this administration took control in 2011, those funds, together with capital receipts, enabled us to provide further new schools, more than had been proposed by the previous administration, culminating in our exceptional school facilities. This report identifies our wish to provide a series of SEN hubs across both primary and secondary schools. These are already established at Hollingswood, Old Park and John Randall is soon to be completed, providing additional capacity for children in their local communities. This is a paper about meeting demand in the next two or three years, with capital funding in place and building on our already excellent school estate, while recognising that schools can't be built or expanded until demand has been reached. We therefore continue to monitor population numbers as it's vital that not only is demand met but also ensuring that there isn't oversupply which would lead to schools facing budgetary pressures. Births have fallen by 14% since 2018 and it is anticipated this trend will continue. Our continued investment has ensured that 98% of primary and 96% of secondary parental preferences are met. This is evidence that we are providing well for our communities. We continue to meet demand and a further 780 primary school places and 300 secondary places are now being delivered. I'm delighted to announce the new primary school in Priorslee, which will provide an additional 420 primary places from September 24. I'm pleased Thomas Telford has been chosen as the sponsor for the school. This school will complement the new 150 place school which is being built at Ulscott, opening in September 23. Expansion will also take place at Lawley Village Academy, as we originally planned. There will be a provision of a further 210 primary and 30 nursery places from September 24. The expansion of school estate also includes secondaries, with 150 places at Arklewood, and a feasibility study is underway for another 150 places in the borough. This report clearly demonstrates the investment in our schools by our administration, with over 20 million in primary schools and nearly 18 million in secondary school in just the last five years. Evidence of this can be found in Appendix A. Our approach is ensuring that we are prepared for growth whilst working within the constraints of the academy programme, which it does need to be noted does not allow the local authority any direct control over their expansions or their admissions process. This report is very much a good news story for families in our borough, building even further on our exceptional school estate and the very high parental preferences. I'd like to thank Simon Wellman and his team for their continued work and move the report and the recommendations 1.1 to 1.5. Thank you. Is that seconded? Thank you. Richard? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good report. It shows that we have growth in our town, but it also shows that through planning, we have the investment in our planning documents to make sure that we have the funding from those developments to fund the infrastructure required to make sure that when these houses are built, that families have the schools appropriately for them to go to. So, you know, it, it's all that we, we sometimes, we have been criticised in the past, even though the criticism was wrong, because through planning, this is how you secure these investments in our communities, the infrastructure needed for education. And it, it's a great report, you know, building on the BSF programme um, that uh, was delivered a few years ago. These schools are now able to be expanded um, to include um, extra pupil numbers, but the investment in new primary education is welcome across the board. And I must thank, you know, the planning department for making sure that happens when these developments go ahead. Thank you. Carolyn? Yeah, I'm, I'm one of those families, really, that Shirley mentioned that um, you know, we moved here 13 years ago um, at the time when we were thinking of starting a family. So, you know, and, and we moved into this borough for exactly the reasons that you've said. It is a wonderful place to live and for children to grow up in. Um, and I'm now at that stage where my, my eldest is looking at secondary schools. We've just done our application. And I have to say how impressed I was going around visiting our secondary schools uh, in order to choose a place because you know th that legacy of the building schools the future and the continuing work that we've done as a council to improve those buildings and work with our school providers is you know is just excellent they're really good facilities so I think this is this is a really good report really welcome the SEN hubs I think that's so important mm -hmm that you know that you get it giving children um, <coughs> all children the best chance for a good education in their communities so I think that's a really positive move um, and, and as Richard said it is about working we are a growing town 
um, you know, we, we were set to be a much bigger town than mm. we are. Um, and, and you know, so we are required to kind of have the, the new developments that, that people see. People do get concerned about that and worried about school places, but you know, as we're showing, we then work through that planning process to ensure that we've got those school places built in either with new schools as part of new developments like All Scott or the foresight that was put into the Building Schools for Future programme to, to en ensure that we're able to have that flexibility to expand and then potentially contract because as you say numbers you know start to can go start to go down as well so I think it's a really good you know a really good approach to school places really welcome it and uh, thank you very much to Cheryl in the offices for putting the report together. Thank you. Paul? Yeah, it's, it's a great report. I wanted to comment on the on the hubs because I think uh, they are a, a, a brilliant addition to the uh, to the to the estate um, and allow uh, children to go to school in their neighbourhoods with their with their communities and I think that's uh, that's a brilliant uh, uh, a brilliant addition to the estate I think it's a good report and uh, I welcome it thank you Bill yeah I'd, I'd, I'd recognize it, the challenges that you have and I, um, I I would like to be in the officer's position trying to crystal ball gaze as to how many there's going to be because you're right it is a challenge because I think I read a report in the paper that over the next 10 years nationally there'll be a million less pupils at secondary school now we are having housing development but you think well will a recession come will that come down from 1100 back to 300 a year and then for those families not moving not moving and I'm also have some sympathy with the fact that you do have your arm tied behind your back to some degree but I think from, from like most of the secondary schools that we have are either academies or grammar schools and unless they decide to opt in and joining with our admissions policy you can't always guarantee well will they expand won't they expand where we would like it to be and I think I don't think the general public fully realise that with the independence that they can academies can have that never mind what we say we want to happen unless they work alongside us and decide that they wish to work alongside us we can't force academies basically to do anything and that's pretty much all the secondary schools that we have and I think primary schools are also becoming academies although less so but I'd, I'd be interested to see how much of a challenge it is and how much you can shall we say work convivially together with these academies it'd be nice to get an insight into that thank you <coughs> yes, thanks. Um, I, I certainly welcome the report as it stands at the moment, but there's a huge area missing out of this, isn't there? And you talk about uh, children being able to go to schools in their locality. What, what exactly is happening in the Newport area? Um, it's a huge part of the borough which seems to be omitted from this report altogether. Um, which, which I, I must admit I don't understand. Now, I know there are two sixth forms uh, in Newport and they're selected. But what are we looking to do? Bus pupils out in Newport across Telford on a substandard public transport system? We are faced with the development of several hundred houses in Newport and that surrounding area. And I don't see any particular mention in this report about that at all. Now, quite clearly, that isn't good enough. This council is quite happy to take um, new homes bonus, council tax from the developments that are going ahead. But we have to put that infrastructure in place. Now that's a large part of this borough. Um, this is very Telford centric and that's fine and I do welcome that. But we need to do more and look at the areas around Newport to allow children, as you say Council of Watley, to go to school in their local areas. Now it clearly is not good enough. Now Bill, you're the leader of a, a group with Newport members and I'd expect to see them fighting on Probably the, more, Andrew. Um, <laughs> actually, Bill, I think it's maybe probably less, but we'll, we'll see where that goes. Uh, particularly the way they're fighting around the education issues, because they're clearly not. Now, really, if I were to mark this out of ten, you know, as an education thing, it's probably four on effort and one on attainment. We really have to start looking at the borough as a whole. You represent that borough, you know, you need to step up to the plate and do it. It's a real, it's a, it's a real shame, isn't it, that when we're talking about school places for children in Telford and Rekin, we get into silly party politics, point scoring, immature debates, um, and yeah, divisive. <laughs> I'm talking about. You, 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 you mentioned 
I wanted to join the Liberals to get out of politics, you know, that that would suit me fine, actually. Well, you don't have to get involved. I'm I never mentioned answer. politics. We're talking about a huge community in part of this borough. Now, try and address that issue. Andrew, last week we had a, well, last, the last um, cabinet meeting, we had a, a two-hour cabinet meeting, the longest cabinet meeting we've had for quite some time, and there wasn't this type of immature... Talking uh, over, uh, talk, talking over people. So please, try and get into long trousers if you can. That Nobody's would be nice. talking. You're talking about cutting out Newport as no, being no, an immature debate. Well, would that's you, what would you like said. me to answer, I Andrew? Because I yes, really would like to. I really would like to hear. If we were going to scoring people, of, you there. were saying about if you were scoring it as a school. If I was scoring you as a school, I'd be giving you naught out of ten for um, not doing your homework and reading the report. Well, actually, I'll, I'll come to you about that particular issue in a moment, but um, can, I, can I just say that it's really important that um, we listen to one another, and w when you when you were talking, Andrew, nobody interrupted you. I've tried to speak twice now, and I've been, you've interrupted me both times. That isn't the way we do politics here at Health and Rekin, so I'd ask you just to listen to me like I've just listened to you. I might not agree with you, you might not agree with me, but Please just have the courtesy of listening, like we listen to you. Thank you. Councillor Reynolds. Thank you. As I was saying, if it was, I would be saying, have you read the report? Because within the report, it is very specific about the report. We have provided 580,000 for investment in Newport infants. We provided 910,000 for investment in Newport juniors. We provided 1.69 million for investment in Burton Borough. Only in 2019-20, have um, Harper Adams and Newport Guilds have now received funding from the Selective School Expansion Program. That again is in the report 2021. As you most probably are aware, there is some Section 106 money that's going to be available in Newport, of which we've already initiated 550,000. Of that's been released, being spent in Burton Borough Schools at this moment. There is some more money that will come through with a second tranche, but as you know, that is not released until a certain percentage of homes have been built. Once those homes have been built, the next tranche will come out, as will the th third tranche in 2025, when those skills are built. And all of that money, every penny of that section 106, which is 1.6 million, is being spent in Newport on educational improvements for Newport. So I refute the comment Thank saying you. we haven't spent money in Newport. Andrew, you've had your say. Stop talking over people. She's finished. She's finished. That was a very polite comment, <coughs> right. Andrew. What and as for sixth form, form <laughs> you've got a sixth form at Harper Adams, you've got a sixth form at Newport Girls. Both are being expanded. Did you not get my point in the report that schools cannot be expanded to over capacity and then they're running with budget funding problems? I've already so highlighted Andrew, population is dropping. Andrew, Andrew, please. Please. That's the core. And of course we've got the station quarter which children from all over the borough will want to go to, it's also, not it's just Newport. It's also worth pointing out that when there was a, uh, there was a change to the, um, to the catchment areas, the schools in, in Newport, uh, we were, uh, uh, Talvin Reeking Conservatives opposed yes. changes that made sure that uh, Newport kids went to Newport schools. Yeah, yeah. So yes. that's yet another example of hypocrisy. It's been moved, it's been seconded. Um, all those in favour? Thank you very much indeed. What I'm going to do, with the meeting's permission, is I'll take um, the item eight now, um, and then item seven, so um, that Paul can leave and, um, and then not be required to come back. Okay. Um, so if we take item eight, which is the 20 mile an hour speed strategy, Richard. Thank you, thank you, leader. I'm pleased to present this report as it provides an update on our commitment to improving road safety while providing a framework for delivering schemes going forward in compliance with national guidance. Cabinet will be aware that the Council continues to receive requests for installing 20 mile per hour speed limit zone or zones at various locations across the borough, and the importance of this work as part of our work to protect, care and invest to create a better borough. We know residents welcome low speed limits by their homes and it makes them feel much safer. As a brief summary of the current position across the borough, there are now 45 20 mile per hour restrictions in place. 
including 26 advisory 20 mile per hour zones, two 20 mile per hour speed limits <coughs> and 17 20 mile per hour zones. In addition, there are further six schemes being considered for delivery within the next 12 months. Guidance from the Department of Transport provides the basis for setting local speed limits, but there is also flexibility in setting limits that are appropriate for the area. If the average speed is already at or below 24 miles per hour, introducing a 20 mile per hour speed limit through signage alone is likely to lead to general compliance with the new lower speed limit. If existing traffic speeds are above this level, additional traffic calming measures will need be needed to be installed to achieve compliance. The proposed 20 mile per hour speed limit strategy sets out the criteria and priorities for delivery of such projects and in delivering it we will continue to consider implementation of 20 mile per hour interventions on a case by case basis. The opportunity to expand single road schemes into wider area based schemes to maximise their impact and benefits will also be considered. Outside our schools we continue to implement advisory 20 mile per hour zones where possible. Furthermore, we will commence work with partners including town and parish councils to deliver a community speed watch programme that will secure over 100 volunteers to assist with monitoring as part of the community speed watch initiative. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the teams involved for their hard work and commitment developing this report. This council have to date delivered a significant number of interventions in this area and the strategy will continue that work to further ensure that our neighbourhoods are a great place to live. The report demonstrates our commitment to supporting road safety in Telford Weekend, and I move the recommendations. Thank you, Richard. Is that seconded? Thank you. Any comments, Lee? Yeah, really welcome. It's obviously um, speeding in communities is, is a massive area of concern. Um, the, the report serves to remind people that um, this isn't a new thing, it's not a new scheme. We've actually been at this for five years and it sets out uh, the work that we've done over the five years in terms of 20 mile an hour zones, but also the safer routes to school investment that we've made. I would point out that we've been continued to make that investment and, and this extra one million now that we're, we're talking about at a time when the government have cut over two million pounds in the last year from our highways budget you know if we put that into context that's the excise duty for about twelve and a half thousand vehicles that they've cut um, uh, from us so really really welcome obviously we would always like to do more but i think um, um, we, we will do as much as we can. Uh, I think one of the good things in here as well is the announcement about those volunteer community speed watch teams. I think that will be a really, really uh, good development. Um, but I would say at this moment in time, whilst there are trials uh, looking at councils taking on enforcement powers for speeds in 20 mile an hour zones, we still rely on the police ultimately to enforce speed in those areas. So um, I appreciate they're under pressures, but the Police and Crime Commissioner really does need to do more in this respect to, to, to reassure communities that they can be safe when they're walking to school or to their local shop or to a place of work. Thank you very much. Shirley? <coughs> yeah, I mean, I do welcome the report. I think it's really, really good, and it'd be nice to see this rolled out across the borough as it is. I'm very fortunate, having worked... Um, with colleagues here. I got some of the safer routes to schools within my own ward. I have one road in my ward that's got four schools on one road. It is really, really difficult, but this was implemented with the 20 uh, mile an hour safer zones around the schools and it did have a really big impact. And actually, one of the biggest impacts was from the local residents who lived around there and some of them actually got in touch with me and said how much better it was for them just living there and people travelling through that area slower. They could actually get off the drives and get around and more children have been encouraged to walk, to walk to school. I've had that actually from the headmistress saying, and it's because parents feel it is actually safer than walking to school because the traffic calming around that area is so much better. So I think it's really, really good. And I think the fact we're still delivering schemes like this when we're facing such massive cuts and you are right, the Police and Crime Commissioner does need to help us, but it would also help us with the enforcement side if we got some of the extra policemen that we've been promised by this mm. government, but we'll, we'll still wait. Thank you. Eileen. Thank you, Leader. Uh, just a really brief comment, because uh, most of it has been said already. Um, it is one of the biggest concerns that people raise with us. You know, when, when I think about people that, that come to me, <coughs> speed is one of the things that is top of the list. So I really do welcome it. I think, you know, it's that 20 is plenty in these areas and I think that's something we've got to stick to. Um, I particularly like the, the community speed watch side of this because I think it enables some of those residents to get involved and really feel like they're able to play a part in this strategy. So I think um, encouraging that is a real positive for people. But I do agree that obviously we need to um, sort of ask that the, the police can can help us to enforce this where they need to but i really do welcome it so thank you thank you caroline 
colleagues have covered most of what I was going to, going to say, but yeah, I mean, I, I welcome the report. As, as Ali said, I think um, as members, speeding and speeding issues is probably one of the, the, the higher uh, issues on our, on our list of casework. Um, it, it certainly is for, for me in my ward and so yeah I w and I welcome the fact that there's a framework around it because I think sometimes um, you know residents have concerns very understandably about speed and they want to see a 20 mile an hour speed limit and sometimes that isn't always practical and because we do have to work within the guidance um, and we do rely on the police to enforce speed limits and if, if if they won't support a 20 mile an hour in a particular area, then, then it, it is challenging. So I think having that criteria, having that framework, makes it very clear where 20 mile an hour zones are appropriate. Also welcome the Community Speed Watch, and I am a Community Speed Watch volunteer in, in my ward. It's quite, it's quite a rewarding thing to do, um, and, it, and it does make a difference, you know, and it's not there to kind of catch people out. Actually, people, you're in high vis, people see you, and then they slow down. So it's, it's really more about an education and awareness and... Uh, raising and getting people just to check themselves when they're driving around and so they're not drifting too high above the speed limit. Um, so I think that will be a really, really good move, getting more people involved in those kind of schemes. So thank you everyone for that report. Brilliant, thank you. Bill? Yeah, I really welcome this report. I've been educated, shall we say, in the, how different it is someone driving at 30 mile an hour to what injuries you can inflict on someone to someone driving at 20 mile an hour. And so I welcome as many of these that we can do around, particularly around our schools, I really do. Um, with regards to Community Speed Watch, um, we've got a very active PCSO where I live called, I'm going to name her anyway because she's brilliant, Trudy Jones, and she's done fantastic. She's set up a Community Speed Watch team by us, so that's very welcome. What I would like to ask, um, if, if you could give me an answer now, working in tandem with this, I think Scruton you've been working on, is it called the School Streets? initiative and, and I know it's got to a point where it's, it's being prepared ready to come to cabinet so that was also to try and reduce the amount of congestion around school areas so I just wondered <coughs> if you could give me an update as to when that's likely to come to cabinet. Thank, Thank you. you. Andrew? Um, well, let's be frank about this, uh, there is some pushback in the community to a 20 mile an hour zone. I have to say that um, I disagree with that absolutely. And I think the introducing these schemes is, is the right thing to do. Um, there's an issue here. I mean, it's all very well having the policies in place, but it is a question of capacity to actually deliver that. Now, I've, you know, I've, I've got to say that um, with, with highways, and I'll say this with Dean here, have been absolutely tremendous in supporting um, a number of schemes that we're looking at, a number of schemes that we want to look at, but there is an issue of capacity. Now, this isn't a criticism at all, but it is a problem that's facing, I'm sure, this authority and other <laughs> authorities, that we need the officers in place, the finance to do that, to actually deliver these schemes. Um, but, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll agree with Bill for once, um, which is great. I think Trudy Jones is, is first rate. And the speed, speed watch schemes <coughs> that I've seen and I've witnessed are, are, are very good. Now, you know, I'm extremely supportive of this, but and again, I'll stress this, it's not a political issue, um, and I'm not criticising that we do need the capacity in that department to actually deliver this, this, this policy. I do, I do gently remind the Leader of the Opposition that the Conservatives have been in power for 12 years and have cut, and have cut local government... Have, Andrew, once again... Yeah, you... Just no, 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 stop. And deal with this... You know, in the spirit it's given, there is an issue of capacity. I recognise that. Never mind the reasons. It's something. No, no, it's no, not a question no. of money. It's a question of recruitment and trying to get people in post. So you've had two. You've had two little little oh, speeches, dear, Andrew. Dear, dear, dear. Both have been listened to without interruption. Now it's my turn. Okay. Then try and make this something. Is your third, this is your third. This is your third. Try and do it in a grown-up way. So this way. is your third contribution without interruption. So I'm going to speak now, okay? So if you would, if you'd listen. So over the last 12 years, local authorities of all political persuasions have had their budgets cut by 60%. Yeah. We've also had a situation of workforce challenges because public sector pay hasn't kept up with private sector pay. There's been an, ex an exodus of, um, of, of planning officers, engineers, uh, a whole set of officers from a whole set of reasons. The Leader of the Opposition says, never mind the reasons, but when you run a council, 
you have to look at the reasons uh, in order to come up with solutions. That's how it works in the real world. Um, so the fact uh, that we've got capacity... Yeah, you're the only one. So... Have you finished? I'm going to continue to talk now, okay? So we've put a huge amount of capacity into the areas of concern that residents tell us are, on, uh, that are, are important. And as Richard read out, we've already introduced 26 advisory zones, two uh, with the speed limits and 17 20 mile an hour zones. This strategy is about putting this issue at the forefront of our priorities uh, and being on the side of our residents. That's what we'll continue to do. We have to take into consideration the reasons that we operate. And as a, uh, an autumn statement coming up, I do hope that we're not going to see further reductions to local government. That isn't just my view. That's the view of the Conservative-led leader of the, of the Local Government Association. Every Conservative leader I speak to up and down the country says the same. I wish you would stop criticising and ignoring the reasons in which we operate uh, for, for cheap political points. So, surely, there was a question from Bill. There was a question from Bill. There was an issue there. I agree with the policy, absolutely. It's really tiresome. It's really tiresome. To implement it. It's really tiresome. Well, I, actually, I've sat here and been stopped from speaking before, which raises the question <laughs> of democracy itself. Eileen, I can show I'm going you to YouTube So, Andrew, I'm going to ask someone else to speak now. So, if you would listen to that person, please, who've listened to you. Surely. Bill asked the question about the um, the school, uh, safer route schools and work scrutiny. Would you like to update the meeting on where we are on that, please? Thank you. Um, yes, that work has obviously gone back to our officers who are working, as you can imagine, Bill, schools weren't able to deal with it. They've only been back seven weeks and the uh, pressures the schools are under in those first few weeks as they go back, settling in new students. COVID is on the rise and raising attainment is at the forefront of what we want our schools to be doing at the moment. But no, it is still on the horizon. We're going to have a meeting with the primary heads and secondary heads, which will, um, Simon, our director, will be speaking to the heads directly because we do need to get the involvement and the buy-in from all our schools and educators for this to work. And yes, then we will be looking for certain pilot schools, but it's very much got to be around the fact we realise this has got to be led by communities with buy-in. We cannot expect our very under pressure teaching staff to be taking this on as a duty for themselves. We're hoping that there will be schools in certain areas. We're going to be doing it on a case-by-case -case basis not going to fit everywhere. Like I said, in my ward, I've got four schools on one road. It would be absolutely not appropriate. The schools wouldn't want it, the local <coughs> community wouldn't want it, but there will be areas in the borough where it will work and it will fit, and those will be the ones that we'll be moving with. So yes, it will be coming back to there, but I cannot see, if I'm being honest, it coming back until after Christmas, because the timing at the moment, you must appreciate, one in 30 with COVID, the cases are rising, and raising attainment is the main focus in this term. I can speak as a teacher that this main term is really, really tough. That's what you do. But we are discussing it with our schools. It will be coming back and it will be a great priority to have in the new year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's been moved and seconded. All those in favour? That's everybody, thank you. So if um, minutes can just record that uh, Paul's leaving uh, the meeting for the declaration that he gave um, earlier on. And we'll now go to the autism draft, draft strategy, uh, Andy Burford. Um, our work locally on the strategy uh, comes at a time that there's a, a welcome increased focus nationally on how society recognises and addresses neurodiversity uh, and, it, and, and, and tries to make the right adjustments and allowances. Uh, this work began as, a, a, as an adult strategy. Uh, albeit with a focus on uh, preparing young people for, for, for adulthood. Um, but in line with national strategy, uh, we're now moving towards an all-age approach. This will mean uh, an evolving inclusion of our children's services and education partners. 
uh, that's really important, I think, because we know the early identification uh, of autism uh, within individuals and their families is, is, is crucial in terms of their uh, of later life. It's, it's understood that many people on the autistic spectrum remain undiagnosed and unsu unsupported. Our aim is to, has to be to, to normalise life as far as possible for all individuals on the spectrum, rather than over medicalising or labelling them. That's got to be central, I think, to, to the way forward. The development of this strategy follows, by now, uh, quite a well-trodden process. It, starting, or as always, with asking people about their lived experience and being clear that they will be closely involved in all aspects of development and implementation of the strategy. We call that, in the jargon these days, co-production. Uh, the questionnaire that was devolved, to, to, uh, that was devised to, to, to do this looked at the areas, as you will see in the report, of housing, health, getting out and about, diagnosis and support, and education, training and employment. And I, I really recommend, uh, if those who haven't had a look at the report, uh, the draft strategy, to, to read the words and the comments of those people with lived experience because uh, I think they are so illuminating. They form the platform of what we need to do with the strategy. The second principle that we followed um, as a cooperative council was to do this work alongside our partners. So in other words, we're talking about par parents and carers, we're talking about the third sector, we're talking about the, the, the NHS and its bodies, and we're talking about the police and other agencies. Crucial to the way we tackle these things. Another key approach is to draw on expert help. And for this, in this instance, we, we work closely with Autism West Midlands, who were invaluable to us as we did this work. Finally, we've established a partnership board uh, to oversee the development of the strategy and its implementation. The, these principles and, and practices have served us well uh, in, in recent times in developing other strategies, for example, learning disabilities and ageing well. And they will ensure a collaborative and meaningful approach and, we hope, some real tangible outcomes at the end of the day. So with that, I'll commend this report to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that seconded? Thank you. Kelly? Um, yeah, just say I really welcome the strategy. I mean, it's vitally important for uh, people's health and well-being, but also the equalities and inclusion that people in the borough on the autist autistic spectrum feel accepted and understood, and that they, you know, they feel from this they've got a voice, and that our services work for them. You know, I think um, this report says autistic population was more significantly affected with anxiety and depression during COVID than any other so I think you know the support needs to be more available um, you know more supported and that the process is you know sort of laid out properly and that's understood how it works and I know that we'll keep listening and I think a huge well done to everyone who actually did take part and gave their voice to help us understand I think it's it's vital and, and massive that we that we can do this and try and be more inclusive and work with people so Thank you. Caroline? Yeah, I welcome the report. Um, I particularly welcome the, the co-production and that involvement of people who, who are autistic, who have their lived experience, and we should always learn from lived experience, shouldn't we? Um, I, I also really welcome that all-age approach. I think you know, the range of services that transition between children's and adult services can be quite difficult, so I think taking that, that whole approach is, is really important because people don't just jump from child to adult, it's a slow transition um, and we need to recognise that and this, this does. But, but I think for me, the, the actions in this I think will have a much broader benefit to a wider range of people because you know, there, there, there are you know, other neurodiverse conditions, there are people, children, you know, people who have had adverse childhood experiences can often struggle in circumstances and, and the things that are in the actions that are in this strategy will actually benefit those people as well so I think this will have a whole range of effects not just for those people who are autistic so really welcome the report. Thank you. Eileen? Um, yeah I really welcome this report I mean as a parent with a, an autistic child within the borough um, I think 
the fact that we're going out to consultation and we're going to try and spread that consultation as far and wide as we possibly can get as many sort of views and um, feedback on on this is a really welcomed um, and the fact that it feeds into everything that we're doing you know and it leading into the employment side of things I think that is a really important piece of this strategy um, so it I really welcome it I think it's going to be a great piece of work I really want to see what comes out of it and how we develop that further on to build in that those other areas particularly sort of skills and employment side of things thank you very much Bill yeah, I, I really welcome this report I, I'm old enough to remember when dyslexia wasn't even recognised when I was a kid and it only just started to come to the fore now. So trying to get that balance of specialist care but also inclusion within the normal mainstream schools, it's, 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 a, real, it's a real headache. And, and this will be another heading which will be screaming funds at some future stage, it's bound to, but um, let's research it and get people's views on there so we know clearly what's best for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. With Bill again. Um, Excellent. I'm very supportive of this report, to be quite honest. Excellent. Okay, that's been moved and seconded. All those in favour? So everybody, thank you. That brings the meeting to an end. Thank you very much.